more. I feel like there was a window <laughs> in my 20s where I could have or would have maybe had the desire to wear leather pants. That season has passed. You can't be in your 30s wearing leather pants. Yes, you can. Not as a man. Yes. No. I bet there's some good leather pants that you could huge, wear. Huge, huge hot take. Men past their 20s should never wear leather pants, and only men in a band in their 20s should wear leather pants. Hey. Welcome to another exciting edition of Hey, It's the Luscos, season two. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Exclamation point. Oh my goodness. Jenny, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm really cold. It's probably the coldest day of the year today. We are filming this. Uh, well, today's episode, by the way, I just wanted to celebrate that is uh, on April 1st. Happy April Fool's Day. Happy April 1st, which is, why does it call get called April Fool's Day? Big yawn. Big yawn. Sorry, I don't know. I have no idea of the origins of April Fool's Day. Uh, do we know what that is? Why do they call it that? Okay, we're looking into this. And while we look into this, uh, I also want to celebrate, this is the 41st episode of our podcast. Oh my gosh. Can you believe that? That's a lot of us. It's a lot of podcasts. That's a lot of us in It's Lesko. been a beautiful journey. We should have celebrated last week, the, uh, the big 40th. We are now over the hill in our podcasting. <laughs> it's good, though. You know, it's like learning curves, growth cycles. You figure out uh, who you are. I feel like we're ready to be confidently into our 40s now. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This is going to be great. We have a lot planned. This is still season two. It's what we're calling it. Uh, and this is the first episode of a month of the month. Welcome the to month. April. Yeah. And well, that's crazy that Easter is just like this weekend. Yeah. Tomorrow is Good Friday. And then, of course, Easter Sunday. What are your thoughts? What hits you thinking about that? Passion Week, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, the whole thing. What, 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 is, what does that take you? Where does it take me? Like gratitude, yes. joy, yes. pain. I'm just yes. curious, like <laughs> when you think back to Passion Week. I should ask you that because you obviously have the wor- the right words to describe it. No, I'm. there's no right or wrong. That's just how you feel. I very much grab You're cold. hugging yourself right now. I see you. <laughs> so I see cold. you hugging yourself. I'm so cold. Um, yes. Thankfulness, like crazy and gratefulness and um, joy and excitement and life and yes. It also is really profound to think about how a year ago at this time, barreling towards Easter in 2020, it was such a time of uncertainty. We were at the height of, you know, everyone sheltering in place. And we also had such I know I can speak for myself, unrealistic, naive sort of expectations that this was going to be over. Yeah, and I remember done. You saying, oh, it'll be over by Easter. I just was and so I just convinced didn't have an opinion at all. We would be gathering by Easter. I was so convinced we would get the worst of it behind us. We'd be back. And how I thought, what a great thing it would be to come back Easter Sunday. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it obviously didn't pan out that way. No. But here we are a year later. And hopefully, every, every single one of you watching, uh, hello. By the way, sometimes I forget to acknowledge video. Me too. Yeah, as you were hugging yourself, I was like, Jenny's hugging herself as though people watching couldn't tell. I'm giving you a hug in my heart. (laughs) And those of you listening, uh, both on Spotify, Apple uh, podcast platform, access more app, you're like, what does Jenny look like right now? Well, she's hugging herself (laughs) again. I guess I could hug her. You guess. Oh, and then, um, yeah. So do we find out what April Fool's Day is all about? Oh, that does make sense. Mm. So France switching from the Julian to the Gregorian was like, just kidding, suckers. <laughs> April Fool's. Have you ever done, well, what's the biggest April Fool's joke you've ever done? I've never really done one. Really? I don't think so. You're not really a jokester. I'm not a big jokester. I'm not a big practical joker. No. I'm not a big. Uh, Why is that, do you think? 
Uh, you don't like to be joked well, upon. April Fools is is pr- usually pretty much people use it as a chance to lie. It's like, hey, we're pregnant. Just kidding. <laughs> hey, and you're not a big liar. Yeah, or like <laughs> pretend you've been hurt, or that's just I don't I don't have a lot of I don't have Did a lot you of ever energy for that. like in high school or junior high or oh don't get me wrong I have a propensity towards deceit like the next sinner okay <laughs> <laughs> no I'm saying like did you ever do a practical joke when you were younger I think the only one I can think of I think there was one maybe 2010 2011 2009, 2009 somewhere around there I think I pretended um we were moving I think I told Olivia or I, some I, something about like moving back to California. That's the only one I can remember or like made people think we were, we were moving to California. I think it was very short lived and I didn't even, I wasn't wholehearted and I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> Everyone's like, uh, what? Yeah. Right. And you're trying to say April fools, April but it doesn't fools, work. April fools, suckers. <laughs> you have to end April fool's day with suckers. April fool's day. April suckers. fool's day, suckers. <laughs> Or, I mean, have you done a pra- April, April Fool's joke? I don't, I don't recall. You don't recall? I feel like I don't have the mind, the strength in my mind to come up with something. And then, because like playing Mafia, like, or those kind of games where you have to like pretend that you're lying or you have to lie. I hate those games because I just don't understand the joy from that. And so I think that's probably one thing that's like, I have a hard time doing it, but then even coming up with something is, I don't have that creative gene to create. Yeah. It's like if, if, if you, if you have nothing else to do, you could sit around and just concoct ways to deceive family and friends. And in the name of science, I guess, <laughs> Hey, we figured out a better way to keep track of the calendar. We're not rotating around the moon anymore. We're fo- focusing more on the sun, you know, cause that's, I think that's the whole julian gregorian thing i have no idea i think that's the thing with that and uh you know it's, it's as good of a time of any uh to as any to tell a lie yes that's but today we're is. not telling lies today no, we're, this, today's we're about, answering questions today's about truth <laughs> today's about seeking out truth uh i do want to camp out a little longer on um just the passion week mm, uh we're good idea well i just think it's really important and powerful to um, take time during this week to to center your heart, to anchor your heart around the different pieces of the, you know, the calendar that we look back on yeah. and we look forward to, because really the whole um, reality of what Jesus went through isn't meant for us just to be something that we look back as the, as though we're you know reading the Gettysburg Address and reading history. It's also meant to build anticipation mm. and, and our faith in the future of what Jesus has promised to do, what he went through changes the way we live in the present, changes the way we live in the future. Yeah. And I, I, I have so uh, over the years learned more to see the process of events in the Passion Week as opposed to just, hey, he died on the cross and oh yes, he also rose from the dead, but to see significance in each of the days. And over the years, I think the day that has maybe become the most significant to me is Saturday. Mm. You know, I think we um, can talk a lot about the crucifixion and we should, and we can and do celebrate the resurrection because it's triumphant, but to find uh, room in Saturday, to find room in a day where Jesus's body was in the grave mm. and he hadn't risen yet, but would, and to find in there comfort and, and solace for the things in our lives that today seem silent, seem like they're dead, but that we can believe for movement, resurrection, hope, meaning. I think that's just so poignant and powerful yeah. and, and helpful. Yeah. Well, and Jesus rising from the dead, the resurrection is everything to us. And it is the power that we, like you said, live both now, but also have the hope of the future of heaven and us being resurrected when we die after we die, like it's everything to us. And so, um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm just filled with like anticipation and excitement and, and just love for our savior. And, um, 
Yeah, I'm amazed. And there's room in the Passion Week, in all the different things Jesus did for us to find exactly what we need. Every every mm. single one of us listening, watching this, uh, we find ourselves at different spots. And you might even find yourself at a vastly different spot than maybe a year ago or that you will next year. Mm. And a different part of it might move you the most. You know, and there's so many different compartments. Um, Jesus cursing the fig tree, that was a part of his movement toward the cross. And that's a funny little one, but it's powerful when you think about it. If And, and if you're, you're listening, you're like, wait, Jesus cussed at a fig tree? And I didn't say cuss, I said cursed. He <laughs> said to this tree that had leaves but no fruit, may no one ever eat from you again. That's one of the funny little quirky, beautiful stories in in the the movement of Jesus to the cross that he was camped out at Bethany and every day he would make his way into the city. And, and one of the days he saw this tree and he was hungry and it wasn't the time for figs, but the tree had leaves, which is significant because trees only, that sort of tree only produced leaves when it had fruit. Mm. But this tree had no fruit, but from the outward appearance proclaimed that it did. And so Jesus cursed it. Yeah. And the next day they saw it and Peter said, Master, it's that fig tree you you cursed. And look, it's shriveled up from the roots and all of it is withered away and has died. And I think the message of that story that if you have to kind of use your historical context to get, harkens back to, yes, I just used Harking. the word hearken. <laughs> There's two great words I love in the King James Bible. One's hearken, one's firkin. Just a different sermon. But <laughs> in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve had fallen and sinned, what did they cover themselves up with? Fig, fig leaves. leaves. Wow. So the fig leaves were that which proclaimed righteousness, proclaimed covering, but really it just covered over nakedness. It wasn't true righteousness, it wasn't true wholeness. They were guilty, they were ashamed, and they were they were hiding. They were no longer, you know, naked and unashamed. Now they had fear and guilt and sin, and it had corrupted everything. But their solution, man's solution, is religion, is cover it up. And that's what religious religiousness does. It just covers up nakedness with with exterior righteousness. And that's what Jesus was cursing on his way to the cross. And that's one of those maybe forgotten crevices of the, the Passion Week story that Jesus denounced religiosity apart from the blood that he was going to shed to make us whole, mm. which is why for Adam and Eve, Jesus next killed a lamb. It took the death of an innocent third party to actually uh, truly cover over what was at the problem. And so yeah. all of us this week, we don't just need, you know, a good example. We don't just need a positive, uh, you know, inspiring story like, wow, he died in rose, like the, the proverbial phoenix from the ashes. No, we needed someone to die for us because of the unrighteousness lurking inside of all of us. Right. And right. there we can find not just itchy fig leaves that cover us, wow, but that's amazing. leather pants. I mean, really, that's that's the idea. Righteousness, truly being clothed. Stretchy leather pants. Stretchy leather pants. Now, Jenny, I've never owned leather pants, but I feel like this is as good of a time as uh, of any, as any. Jeez, I have a hard time with that expression. Twice <laughs> in this episode, I've said, as good of time of any. <laughs> it's okay. Say it. Bless your heart. Can you say it? Just as good a time as any. As any. I'm going to try that again. Hey, Zalesco's, and we're here <laughs> to probe the deep things, like why it's so hard for me to say it's as good of a time as any. Did I do it? Yeah. Oh, man. Good Thanks. job. Now, you have leather pants, right? They're faux leather. Faux leather. Mm -hmm. Would you say they're made of fig leaves? No. What, what are they made out of? Tofu? <laughs> <laughs> vegan. They're Im vegan. They're vegan pants. Impossible pants? <laughs> uh, would you say beyond pants? Uh, well, they don't fit me these days. So, well, maybe they Aren't would they these stretchy? days. No. They're not stretchy enough? Well, I have like leggings that look like they're leather, but they're more shiny. I feel like there was a window <laughs> in my 20s where I could have or would have maybe had the desire to wear leather pants. That season has passed. You can't be in your 30s wearing leather pants. Yes, you can. Not as a man. Yes. No. I bet there's some good leather pants that you could huge, wear. Huge, huge hot take. Men past their 20s should never wear leather pants and only men in a band in their 20s should wear leather pants. That's my hot take. Wow. I mean, I, 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 I Keith Richards. Keith I think, Richards can wear leather pants. I don't know who that is, but I think Rolling Stones? Um I think guys could. I think you could. Mick Jagger can wear leather pants. Also Rolling Stones. 
But I think if they weren't like flashy with a bunch of zippers, I think I, I feel like there are kind of leather pants that aren't like let super me, shiny. Let me just say that, that once you could wear. once you've made the choice to go down leather pants road, <laughs> you have barreled towards flashy. You have left all non-flashy lifestyle choices out the window. But for women too? Oh, men. I don't know. I disagree. That's a hot take right here. <laughs> We're going to need you guys to weigh in on this uh, huge debate. Oh. Leather pants, that is a choice that is, should be left behind in your 20s or heck no, wear your leather pants. Do your little thing Do it. on the catwalk. Yeah. I'm, no, I'm just telling not you. on the catwalk, just in life. I am probably never going to wear leather pants. Unless That'll I have- That'll be my goal then. In heaven. Wait, you want me to wear leather pants? Yeah. That's your goal. Yes, in life. It's Easter and we're here talking <laughs> about deep things like leather pants. Well, before we move on, I do want to say I hope that you find some time in the in your schedule this week to just uh, quiet your hearts. Yeah. Look up uh, at the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, some of the details Jesus went through, walk in his footsteps, um, realize there's power in it to change you, to transform you. And that the risen Lord who is with you through his spirit wants to um, to make you in his image, to make you um, not just a, a better version of yourself, but a, a resurrected version of yourself. That's what he's going to do ultimately with your mm. body, but he wants to do that inside your heart through the spirit that lives right, in you. Right. I just read this morning in Psalm 37, it said, be still and wait patiently for the Lord. And I think, like you said, there's such a power in just being still before the Lord and um, and asking him to meet you right. I love how earlier you said that you, we might be looking at this week within a variety of um, perspectives and just where we're at in life. And, and God can meet us and wants to meet us right where we're at. So just the beauty of being able just to be still and wait patiently for the Lord, allowing him to give us the lenses to see um, the power and the beauty of this week and what he wants to do deep inside of us. Absolutely. And if you are looking for any like, hey, where should I read uh, beyond the Gospels? Read Isaiah 53, mm. read Psalm 22, and let it settle you to think that even hundreds of years before um, Jesus came, that God had already made very clear what he was going to do through through his son's sacrifice. And mm. I mean, this is stuff written I mean, Psalms, I mean, it was written a thousand years before Christ came. It was written hundreds of years before crucifixion was even invented. Mm -hmm. And yet here's prophecies uh, in, in staggering detail showing that Jesus would die raised up on, on, on something above the ground with his hands spread out, his bones out of joint. Man. And it's just so humbling and inspiring and beautiful to think about how much God loved us, that he was willing to do all of this to restore us to yeah. himself. Yeah, amazing. What is your favorite, I mean, that's a really rough question, but most moving to you part of the Passion Week? Oh, gosh. I'm circling back now because I asked you earlier and you tried to shove it on me. Oh, um, I would say one of them would be the picture of Mary at looking up and seeing her son on the cross and um, just that moment in and of itself, just a mother watching her son die and also her knowing that that was also her Lord and her savior, like just all those, that, those mixed feelings. But then also when Jesus took the time to take care of, to make sure she was taken care of. And when she, when he told John, um, uh, man or son, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. It saying he's going to take care of you. And Basically, I love you, mom, and I'm thinking of you from my excruciating pain right now. And that is really beautiful to me. Absolutely. That's How so touching. You? Well, and that's and that that's the fulfillment of a prophecy given to her when Jesus was a baby. Mm, sword will pierce your soul. Yeah, the Simeon. He held Jesus at Jesus' circumcision and then um, prophesied that he was destined for the rise and fall of many in Israel. And then he looked to Mary and said, and a sword will pierce your heart. Mm. And really kind of, and the Bible says she pondered these things in her heart. So it's almost like God was preparing her for that moment. Yeah. Because there's no doubt that when she saw Jesus on the cross, that a sword in that moment pierced her through. Mm -hmm. And 
yet what confidence it would have given her to look back on, hey, God prepared me for this moment and he's going to sustain me in this moment. Yeah. And that's one of the things I think that's so powerful about always living, especially in good moments, because there's not a better moment for her than baby's out, she's holding him, there's, you know, celebration, but they're they're there at the temple again. They're showing up for church again. They're doing the things they needed to do. And the fact that they were giving birth to God, right, didn't preclude them from, hey, we're still going to go to church. We're still going to circumcise. Like, I think sometimes you can maybe make the mistake. I know I've met lots of people, um, you know, and I'm not not trying to, like, sound harsher than I am, but I've met people who maybe do things for God, like, you know, maybe write a book or maybe tour as a musician. And they kind of take that as, like, when I've asked them per- personally, um, hey, where do you go to church or this? It's like, well, I'm out on the road all the time doing this. I don't really have a church. I And mm. I, I kind of think there can be the mentality that kind of says, um, because I do great things for God, I don't really need to do the, the things that normal Christians need to do. Yeah, We've wow. always you know, tried to pattern for our kids, like especially on vacation or whatever, we're going to find a church to go to. We're going to we're going to still, even if it's online, we, we want to be under the teaching of God's word, even especially when I'm not teaching or when yeah. you're not teaching, that we still need as a family God's word. We still need as a family. Like doing stuff for God is no ex- doesn't give you any immunity from just needing the same things that every Christian needs. Yeah. We all are just people. And I love that Mary and Joseph, they didn't go, we don't need to go give the offering of two turtle doves and mm. do this. Or, like. God's going to give us a pass because look what we've done for him. They still wow. were showing up. Like literally later on when Jesus gets lost, it says they showed up at the temple for this, you know, holiday as Joseph and Mary did every single year, Yeah, which was the Feast of Booths. 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 Which essentially was a camping trip. So that's touching on two levels. Here's Joseph and Jesus camping, hmm. you know, and Mary. Love that. But I also love that they just were normally going like they... Hey, this we're raising God. Yep, we're we're gonna go to church. We're gonna go to synagogue. We're gonna give the offering. We're gonna give the you know. It's like we're gonna sing the Psalms of Ascent. Walk into Jerusalem. Like, mm. so I just love that. That you know, I always tell the story. But I I had asked this person in our church who had served God for a very long time. Hey, are you gonna get on a team and serve? And he said to me, you know, I've been in the church uh, for so many years, and I I think I've paid my dues. Dang. And I just <laughs> took exception to that. Like, I've paid my dues. Like, what does that even mean yeah. that now? I've served God so long, he's lucky to have me. And I, you know, I don't think it's ever a thing that we work off our, our sentence, you know, it's like, it's like you ramp up even more. And I love how you talk about like retirement should be more of a, now you're released to serve God in more ways and empower the church and serve the church in more ways. I think that's a really sad perspective of that. It's interesting because it's so different than. Romans 12, which says, in light of the mercies of God, which basically is the cross, present yourself as a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. Yeah. So essentially what Paul's saying there is, if you're blown away by what Jesus has done for you, which we all should be this week, Passion Week, mm. our response should be to say, God, I, I want to give you everything. Yeah. I want to serve you all my days. Like, what can I do? I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than, you know, whatever. Like, mm. any, give me a mop. You know, give me a toilet brush. Give me a give me a, a pulpit. Give me a microphone. Give me a, a box of goldfish crackers and a, a you know a flannel graph, right? Like, <laughs> essentially, yeah. or the orange video for the week. Right. The, the heart is, you died for me. I'm going to spend my whole life serving you. Yes. And never a sense of like entitlement to, you know, whatever. Okay, so that's, that's good. That's, that's, a, that, that's good a good little away. tangent. It's a good takeaway tangent. How would would it be? Would you call that a tangent? Tangent. Takeaway tangent. Tangent away. Well, it is the first of the month, and we introduced last month in March a brand new segment, and that is an episode at the first of the month. As long as we have energy towards it, as long as we have breath in our lungs. And as long as we have questions to answer. <laughs> called the question and answer segment. And what's so fun about this is we we get to hear your voices. Mm-hmm. And I loved it in March and I love it even more now. 
So what we asked people to do was to send us a voice memo or a DM uh, voice note on Instagram with your name, where you're from, any question you have. Not that we would purport to have the answers, but that we would struggle or try yes. on the spot. We've not heard try any of these. Try our very best. We have not heard it. Not heard a single one of these. So we don't know what so these are about. We don't know what of... the deal is. Um, and then, yeah. So if you would love to participate in the next one, we'll be accumulating and stockpiling these for the 1st of May. Which is a lovely thought to think about May coming. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, it really is. It's nice. I like May. It's your birthday month. Birthday month, warmth, pollen. Mother's Day. Mother's Day. Cinco de Mayo. Mm. Mexican food. And the return of going outside and fishing and being outdoors Camping. more. Camping. All the things. Walking outside and not freezing to death. Yeah, so send us a uh, question if you have one. Um, to Levi at freshlife.church. You can just take a voice memo on your phone and we'd love to hear you. It's so fun hearing your voice on, it on the podcast. It is really fun. So fun. And br- uh, extra credit if you include either your imp- impersonation of our jingle, the Hey, It's the Lesko's jingle, or what you think it actually should be. And Torin Wells gave us a lot to think about last he week. He did. He did. He gave us some two great, great, was it two weeks ago? Mm-hmm. Okay, two. Yes, you're right. Michael Todd last week, two weeks ago, Torin Wells gave us uh, oh, a tremendous- A few of them. A and tremendous- There's some really good ones. Bevy of options, you might say. Bevy. A bevy. Isn't I don't it know a that bevy word. like a raft of options, a flotilla of choices? I think the definition of bevy is like multi- A large group of people or things of a particular kind. Yeah, so Torin Wells gave us a bevy of choices. <laughs> but we're not done. We'd love to hear yours. So your your vocabulary is very wide and expanded and far and reaches to the ends of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm like I feel like I'm in a little canoe and I'm rowing in a very tiny creek of vocabulary. <laughs> you just said my vocabulary reaches to the ends of the earth. And then you said you're in a tiny dinghy. Canoe. A tiny canoe. Canoe is better than a dinghy. It's funnier to be a dinghy <laughs> in a creek. And what, is your like paddle barely even? Is like your paddle like over t- the rocks? Is your paddle like comically small <laughs> and just a stick and not even an actual paddle? Because like, like, my a, like a like a Flintstones bone. You're just like paddling with a bone. I'm just scraping across the rocks. <laughs> There's not even water. <laughs> You're like Johnny Depp in like Pirates of the Caribbean <laughs> when it was just in the desert. <laughs> My problem is I, like, my mind reaches for words and then never usually, like, grabs them. So then I have to result, I have to, like, resort to a very low level of vocabulary word. That is hilarious. Because <laughs> they're there. They're just not, like, easily reached. Okay, so I don't know what... if it's I'm too short in my, in my mind. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so you're comically small, too? And you're reaching on words that are on a shelf that you can't get to and there's no step stool? Yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing about me that I've never told publicly. I made it my goal when I was a freshman in Bible college to read the entire dictionary. Gosh. And I had a friend and we went to the, I think Barnes and Noble or Bo- might've been Borders back then. We bought these two dictionaries. Matt, I have it in my office right over there. And we bought these dictionaries and I was our, it was our goal to read the entire dictionary. Oh my gosh. I didn't make it through. But I did How enjoy How far it. did you make it? Oh, I, d- I probably didn't even make it past the A's. But I, I read a lot of words, at least to start with the letter A. <laughs> so tell me what you need to know about it. But I actually really enjoyed it. I think I just moved on in life, but didn't ever get like, I didn't ever like hate it. I loved it all until I stopped doing it. Wow. And I always thought, man, that's a great word. That's a wonderful word. And to this day, one of my favorite things in the world is a thesaurus. There's very few things I enjoy more than seeing a number of options for a given word. I love that too, but my brain just doesn't hold those very well. Do you go to a thesaurus app like regularly? I go to the dictionary app like regularly and there's a thesaurus, thesaurus. within. Well, but I think it. the big thing is that you read constantly. And so I think you just are always, like, honestly, there's times where you're teaching where you use a word that I don't know. So it's, I literally have to write it down and like look it up later or That's funny. look it up. In that moment. One pro tip, if you're on a Mac, like a Mac computer, they have a built-in <laughs> dictionary app on the Mac Mac that like a Mac computer, not a Mac truck. Yeah, for correct. Clarity, if you're clarity. on a Mac truck right now, <laughs> just focus on the road. If you're on a laptop, 
you can hit the Apple space bar and type D-I-C-T. It'll bring up in this little Siri finder thing. It'll bring up a dictionary. And then there's going to be on the top uh, home row, there's going to be dictionary thesaurus, and there's going to be a word that says all. If you hit all, then type a word in, you're going to see dictionary definitions, thesaurus definitions, and Wikipedia entry for that word all in one screen. So it's a really efficient way that's, that's the primary view that I like to use on that. Because then it's just, you don't have to go to the dictionary, then thesaurus, and, and then, you know, if you want to go to Wikipedia, it's just a nice compact way to approach it. Yeah, that's awesome. It's very yes. helpful. Those helpful are the, tips. Th- those are the tips. All right, so let's get to some questions. Now that we're <clears throat> 32 minutes into this episode, mm. uh, we meant to start the questions much sooner, but we got so How beautifully. Do you know that? I could see on this little screen. Oh. All right, so we're going to. Uh, struggle through some questions. Let's uh, let's start right here. Oh, this one is. All right, Levi, here goes. I lost my 10 week old oh. daughter last January. We just celebrated her one year anniversary in heaven. And my question for you and Jenny is, other than your other kids and each other, how did you guys decide to have another child after suffering such a devastating, devastatingly hard <laughs> loss in your life? Um, I am from Florida, and my name is Casey, and I just really appreciate both of you appreciate your wisdom your knowledge and your guidance well thanks casey for um sending your question and gosh we're just so sorry for the ache and the pain and the loss and the hurt that you've walked through this past year and we're just heartbroken with you and aching for heaven with you and, um, grieving with you. And we're just so sorry. And, um, honestly, uh, we weren't planning on having more kids after Clover, who's our youngest. And after Lenny went to heaven, we honestly were like happy with four daughters. And, um, I don't know if you want to say Levi, but God made it clear <laughs> that we were supposed to have another baby. And that was what was so beautiful about it is that there wasn't a, I mean, I always think it's awkward when couples talk about trying to have a baby, you know, like, <laughs> oh, we're trying to have a baby. I'm like, that's a lot of information right now. You know, oh yeah, we're, we're trying, like, we're just really trying. I'm like, well, that's great. Good I mean, for you. I would just say we were, I understand what you're saying. First of all, thank you for, goodness, thank you for telling us about your the ten, the special 10 weeks you had with your child and and the <clears throat> that we're together and joining we're joined together this Easter week in the triumphant hope that we will see our children again yeah. who have gone before us yeah. to be with Jesus. Yeah. And just as Jesus said let the little children come to me, you know, he has allowed our kids uh both your your baby and and Lenya to to be with him and we'll come to them again. Yeah. They can't come to us, we will go to them, but yeah. um we I remember vividly thinking about how hard it would be to have another child and just every day dealing with the reality, like this, this child doesn't know Linya and it's almost like two different families, the family before the crisis, the family after the crisis. Mm. And then when God sent Lennox our way, um, I would just say this, it never has been what I thought it would be. Mm -mm. It's just been a joy. It's been a a, a gift. And there's been a piece that passes understanding because it did give us anxiety to think about how hard it would be to be pregnant again and to deal with all that again. Um, And honestly, all those concerns, those worries have, at least from my perspective, I won't speak for you, they haven't materialized. I mean, there's been just gift of joy that God's brought into our home through Lennox. Yeah. No, I agree with that. I know that um, there were moments leading up to me being in the hospital and having Lennox that were hard and just kind of like running towards the roar kind of thing of, oh, there's no way, like I'm not, I have to go to the hospital and I have to, 
which is Lennox the same was born hospital. in the same place Linya was born and where Linya was declared yeah. to be dead. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that. It's like I had no choice. I had to show up and have my baby at the same hospital. Um, but then also afterwards, like I remember just there was like a heaviness. Um, I'd be nursing Lennox and just weeping and just feeling like the grief in a new way. Um, but then Lennox also had a lot of the same allergies as Lenya too. So walking through that road. And so, I mean, it's hard, but like you said, there is still, there's so much joy more, like you said, than what I could have ever imagined having, um, the bad has been much worse than we ever thought. And the good has been beyond what we could have imagined. Mm -hmm. So I would just say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Yeah, and, if you feel like God's leading you. It, and for us, God made it very clear. You know, we, like you said, weren't expecting on more kids and God just made it clear. And he just, there's a grace that accompanies that. So, and honestly, it even has been a, a way of us having our hearts healed from grief, I would mm, say. We'd, definitely. All right. So well, thank you for your question. God bless you and yeah. your family and all that you put your hand to. Here's another question. Hey, this is Sarah from Queensland, Australia. My question for you is, what is the most fruitful season that you've ever had? And was it because of the spiritual disciplines that you had in place leading up to that season day in and day out? Or was it because you were finally having breakthrough and it was just a season of rest where there was that fruit or perhaps um, because you're walking through something hard that you were pressed in and um, that was the reason for it being fruitful? And the other part of that question would be, did you notice it in each other's lives and did others notice it um, by looking in and just seeing the fruit or was it just something that you knew was happening in your own life? Thanks. What a lovely accent. So beautiful, Sarah. Sarah from Queensland. First beautiful of all, Queensland's accent. an amazing place. Do you yeah. remember being there? Yeah. Uh, that's North Australia, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Queensland is in the north of Australia. I'm almost positive. Yes, it has to be. Is that right? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah's like, yeah, your geography skills are questionable. Um, <laughs> thank you for writing. Jenny, how would, writing. Thank you for writing. Thank you for speaking. Thank your you question. for telling us your question. Uh, yeah, that's such a good thought. Really, it's so hard to know when you're in it what is that's the most true. fruitful thing. That's true. Right? Yeah. Because you look down and it's like almost like, it's hard to see yourself growing. Then one day someone see who hasn't seen you in a while sees you and goes, wow, hey, when did you shoot up? Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's true. Because it's just a daily growth that you don't really, you're not really aware of until like you look back and you're like, oh, that was a fruitful season or right, right. I did grow. The, but the question specifically being, what is it correlated to? And I would say what you said about spiritual disciplines and the consistency of that, I think is massive. But I also think that, that, that some of ironically and perhaps detestably, it also is linked to the most challenging seasons. Mm. Why? Um, well, it takes fertilizer being thrown on stuff for plants to grow. Right. So even though none of us like to have crap thrown, thrown on, at heap, us. heaped on us. <laughs> In some of those situations, I think when you're doing diligently the right things, prioritizing health in your soul, in your relationships, in your body, that's massive for me yeah. and mental health. Then you look back and you go, man, God allowed a challenging season and I was being faithful, doing the right things. Those tend to correlate, maybe not right away, but give it, give it months of that. And you watch and you're like, there really was, there really was. Uh, fruitfulness attached to that. Yeah. It's interesting looking back because you can kind of pinpoint different, at least I feel like because you're looking back on a life that you're living, but then you can kind of almost see, I guess, kind of like the blooms, like where it's like those little like markers, like this was a point where I felt growth or this was a point where God spoke to me or this is like a kind of like altars, you know, yeah. along the way. Um, and I would say, I mean, honestly, for me this past year, I feel like looking back, I see exponential growth. And I think that 
going through quarantine and the pandemic like almost intensified that and almost created like created the growth almost in a um I don't know pressure cooker type thing where it's kind of was happening seemingly almost faster because you had time you had um space there was we were giving God a little bit more space to be able to work that in us. And so looking back for me, even like with my book coming out and breaking my ankle and going through just some emotional, just hard stuff, like, and seeing answers to prayer and seeing strength and seeing growth and seeing, oh my gosh, like I'm actually seeing me progress. And it's not like such a, like, um, centimeter by centimeter walk. It's like, oh, I see strides. Like, so I feel like when you look back sometimes and you see God's faithfulness and you see um, what he's done in you and you, you can kind of feel it like that, that's really amazing. But like you said, sometimes you don't feel it. And then you just are all of a sudden like, wow, I'm not struggling with that yep. anymore. The trick is, I think, when you do get to one of those bloom times, it's often connected more to what you did months prior than what you're doing right then. Right. So you can be tempted to let off the gas, but what you're missing the chance to do at the top of that curve is to begin a new one. Yeah. And if you don't, inevitably the energy will take you back over the falls of the bell curve that you're always on. Everything's a bell curve and everything has that beginning, that initial rise. Nothing stays up and to the left forever. Eventually it's going to kind of come down unless you begin a new one. So I think it's that faithfulness, that muscle confusion, that mixing it up and that consistency that's going to lead to the next thing, the next bloom, the next cycle, the next season. And so I think you have to um, just resolve to never let yourself get into a cruise control, to not let yourself plateau. One of my favorite books I've ever read is Rut, Rot, or Revival by uh, A.W. Tozer. Yeah. He says, you'll inevitably end up in a rut in life. And in that rut, you either have to revive or you will rot. Yeah. And so I think it's just that mentality that says, I, I'm not going to allow myself to decompose here. I'm going to choose to continue to start that new uh, cycle again. Yeah. All right. That was well, a thanks, great Sarah. question, Sarah. And Pray God's blessing over you and your What a beautiful, life. beautiful voice you have. Okay. Let's hear, I'm just mixing them up here. Eeny, meeny, miny, mad with power. Need to be okay, so my first question. My Whoa. name is Josh. I'm uh, Two questions. from Southern California. I am a pastor. Six months ago, became pastor of an online campus. I also oversee marketing and communications department for our church. Uh, my question for you guys is how do you deal with challenging individuals within church, within ministry, um, in a way that honors and glorifies God? Josh. Thanks, Josh. The question of questions. How do we deal with difficult people? Yeah. Well, we start by recognizing we are difficult people. Good one. <clears throat> right? I mean, that's the truth. Yeah. We're all difficult in our own unique ways. Right. And when we start there, hey, there's ways that I'm difficult. I'm not always easy to get along with. Neither are you. We then are at least in a position of humility to approach the recognition that there are also difficult aspects to other people. That's so good. That's well, really good. I where you take it from there. would say um, that's a great place to start. And um, I think knowing that God's called us to lead all kinds of people and whether um, they're people on our staff or people in our church and leading teams or on teams or just coming to church, there's going to be all different kinds of people. And, um, and I think that that's part of the call on our lives when God's, when I, when God first called us to be in ministry, it's like, that's part of it. Like remembering that God didn't just call us to the things that are easy. He called us to all of it. So the yeah, things good. that are hard too. And, um, and I think when we remember that proverb that says, um, Without any oxen, the troughs are clean, but with with much oxen comes much uh, mess or whatever. <laughs> that is not what it is, but it's something to that effect. But basically, we're back to fertilizer again, <laughs> and we're back to me not having the words to say. Um, but I think that when we remember 
that when we have a people, we have a church full of people, it's going to be messy and it's going to be imperfect and it's going to be hard. But there's beauty in that and that's where and there's life in that and there's strength in that and there's growth in that for us as leaders to be humble and to um to see where the other person is coming from and to um ask God for wisdom and discernment like that's all part of leadership is not trying to figure it out on our own or um try to make things happen but truly asking God for leadership and Very for good. strength and wisdom. But I think you have to also recognize like no matter how hard you try, you're not going to always be able to work things out well. Mm-hmm. And you have to be okay with that. The Bible yeah. never says live at peace with everybody. It says live at peace with everyone so much as it lies within you. Yeah. So I think when you start with the recognition, look, I've got my own faults, I've got my own hangups. Then you go, okay, I'm going to do what I can to serve and to and to, you know, go out of my way to make this situation work and provoke sometimes hard conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a huge art. I would recommend a resource. I think it's called how to have difficult conversations. It's a great book. Um, and, and make it a part of your leadership that you, uh, seek out the hard conversations, not, not trying to get into fights, but that you, you don't just be passive aggressive and leave things buried that if something needs to be said, you say it, you don't want the people under you to have this thing like, Oh, I wonder what's wrong with this person. I wonder what I did wrong. You want to have a culture where, Hey, if something's an issue, I want to talk about it and then move on yeah. and not have it just be like, Oh, like this weird tension. Every time this person's in the room, you know, um, not, not that kind no one wants to stay around that kind of a leadership environment because it's toxic, but you also have to know like, Hey, it's not always going to work out well. And sometimes yeah. just gonna, we're going to have to part ways and that's okay. There's necessary endings to relationships and seasons, and um, you could do everything right, and still there's going to be top, sometimes things that go topsy turvy. It happened to Paul. Hello, it happened to Jesus. It's going to happen to you, yes. and just sort of I would normalize some of those things. Mm. That's one thing uh, that that uh, I have to remind myself. Like, man, someone who I thought was going to end stay with us is leaving. She's like, hey, that's normal. It's, it happens to every church. It happens yeah. on every staff. It happens on every team. If you think you have the capacity to keep every and retain every single person, uh, then you somehow have a Superman Messiah complex mm. that is unrealistic. So I would just say it, everything we've said is good. Have a, a nuanced view of it. Seek out the hard conversations so that there can be peace, but know that even if you do everything right, there's not always going to be that good ending. Right. Yeah, that's good. Very good. Let's hear... I was, I'm like, thinking, let's hear from Bob in Cleveland. Like, we don't know who where they are, who they are <laughs> yet. We're going to get there, though. Here's one. Hey, Pastor Levi and Jenny. This is Tara from Kalispell, Montana. And I was wondering how, as parents, we can teach our children to learn to identify and hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Tara. That's a great question. Um, I think it starts with, praying that over them. I remember um, one year our daughter Olivia went to camp and that was my prayer for her was that she would hear the voice of the Holy Spirit um, and be sensitive to his leading in her life. And it was really special when she came back, she told us that there was a moment where she um, had, she connected with someone who wasn't on the trip. I think she was on an airplane or something, but she said um, that she felt led to to speak up and to talk with this person. And she got to share hope with him. And I was just like, that was just a little glimpse of that. But I think it does start with praying that over them. Yeah. Then two other things I would say, one is modeling that. Yeah. So like your, your kids should see you having your quiet time, see you like my kids, when they wake up, they're going to know where Jenny's at. She's going to be at her quiet time spot. They're going to, they're going to find us seeking God yeah. and that we regularly weave into conversation. Oh, here's something God said to me. Or when I apologize, I'll say, Hey, I felt like the Holy Spirit really convicted me about how my tone was in that. So I'm sorry. So we're modeling that. Then I think we, um, instead of rushing in with answers for our kids, we should ask them more questions than we give answers, right? Mm. That's just a general rule in parenting where we ask, we're asking them, like, what do you think the right thing to do here? What, what, what you know, what, as opposed to just telling them, mm. even when we know, especially when we know. Yeah. And then we're, one of the questions to try and regularly weave into your parenting is, what is God saying to you about this? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you about this? And so 
and and then let them have the space. And they might not always have an answer, but, but eventually they will. You're cultivating, you're sowing seeds. That's and good. so continue to do all those things. And I think God will God will bless those sorts of things. Yeah. Thanks, Tara. All right. So uh, here's uh, another one. Hey, Levi and Jenny. Uh, this is Christian. I am from Moore, Oklahoma. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this. And uh, I'm, I'm going to jump right into my question. It's uh, a little more serious. Um, so for context, I lost my mother. Um, she was 54 years old in October of 2020. Um, it's a little bit of a longer story of what occurred, but um, I, what you really need to know for the question is just that it, you know, as sudden loss does, it just has knocked me off of my feet. Um, I'm a pastor. I am, you know, just very much in a dark place of walking through that. The The question of, you know, why do evil things happen um, never used to rattle me before. It, it does now. And so um, I heard you, Pastor Levi, when you were speaking at Jeremy Foster's church um, earlier in 2020, you said so much of it changed for you when you went to God and said, I'm angry. And he said, I am too. Are you able to kind of um, just unpack that? I'd, I'd love to hear from uh, either one of you or both of you just on how you lamented, what did that look like? Because I, I find myself personally, each time I get into my my quiet place, I, I I just, I grit my teeth. I get so angry that God allowed my mother who loved him so much and um, was the reason I came to know the Lord, that he would take her so unexpectedly and not to heal her. And so um, I, I, I say this, just I, I do want to also just say that your ministry has done so much for my family and our lives. Just you guys are, you know, you, you guys are very familiar with um, loss, unfortunately, and that has done a lot for um, us in our healing process as well. And so, um, yeah, thank you for taking the time to answer this. I don't know if I have a funny jingle uh, to sign off on, but or uh, you know, our impression, but I'll try. Let's go. Thank you, guys. Did you say his name was Jeremy? Christian. Christian. Let me make sure that's. Hey, Levi and Jenny. Uh, this is Christian. Ah, you're right. I was so positive it was Jeremy. Because he said Jeremy Foster's church. He said Jeremy. Okay. Christian, um, thank you for sharing that. That was beautiful. And hearing your journey, hearing you ask those questions. And I love that you use the word lament. Mm. And this week is a week where we're not only celebrating Easter, but there is l- l- lamenting in it. There is sorrow in it. Yeah. Um, there, there's such bitter, bitter sweetness to the resurrection because he had to die first, but he was willing to. I mean, just I, I think it was Tim Keller who said, the gospel is that we were so bad, Jesus had to die, but we are so loved that he was glad to die. Mm. And there is lamenting and joy in that. Yeah. And I think what you're saying is is so powerful. And I know speaking for me, God resonating with my anger is one of the key things that move me forward in the grief process. Yeah. Because a lot of people get stuck at that stage. Angry at God and they check out. And you can be when I realized you can be angry at God, but find power in his reciprocated anger you can then move forward with him because you realize you're not at odds with him, right. that you're together against this thing. And I saw it for the first time, for the first time, there's lots of places we could point to, Habakkuk and other other parts of the Bible. Um, but in John 11, you have this great anger. You see it in Martha's eyes. You see it in Mary's questions. You see it in that whole scene. But when Jesus watched their grief, he joined in in anger. Even though he knew he was going to resurrect him, he was angry at death, angry mm. at sin, and so I, I just remember finding myself like, "Oh, I don't, I don't, I'm not alone in being mad, and God's mad too, and that's why He never wanted Adam and Eve to sin, never wanted me to sin, and that's what brought this this curse in. And so, in your Christian and your mom and and all that, I think the futile thing is trying to figure out why, because we will know all that even as we are known one day. Um, but but even now we can we can ask the question: What is God 
wanting to do to redeem that difficulty. And he's doing it even in your spirit, even as you continue on in ministry, even if, as you, like you said, go to your quiet place and love your family and love mm. the city, you're, you're serving out of this legacy that you get to steward of your mom and her faith and that, that she brought you to the Lord. And now you're living out of that. That's powerful. Yeah. And we're so sorry for um, your pain and what you're experiencing. And we just um, grieve with you and just believe that, like Levi said, I think there's, there is power in um, showing up and just um, asking God for strength in those moments. I think there have been moments where I've, I have felt so overwhelmed by, um, by the ache and the pain and the grief. And I think for me, it wasn't as much anger. I mean, there definitely were moments of anger, but it was more, um, just, just the ache, just that like heaviness on your, on your soul that makes it hard to breathe. And I think in those moments for me, it was, it was literally like, God, help me to breathe right now and help me to show up right now and be a wife and be a mom. And and I think those kind of things where we just say, God, help me to help me to open your word, help me to worship you. Like like you, you said, Levi, to be able to um, move forward with God, knowing that he's right there with you is so helpful. And then you look back and you see God's faithfulness over time and you feel and you feel and experience the strengthening because you don't always feel that throughout the whole process. You don't feel strong. You don't feel like doing the things that you're supposed to do. But as you just keep showing up and keep being faithful and keep asking God for the strength, you look back and see, I'm getting stronger and I am stronger. And there's a beauty in the sadness. There's a beauty in the melancholy. And I think um, as I learned through time to appreciate the sadness and appreciate, you know, driving by the graveyard and feeling um, sorrow, but hope yeah. and letting that all swirl together yeah. in, in beauty. And I mentioned it a minute ago, but Habakkuk said, um, I'm going to, I'm going to embrace you. I'm never going to let go. His name means one who embraces. And he, he doesn't understand why God's doing what he's doing. Why you'd allow the Babylonians to come in. But he says, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop seeking you. I'm going to go to my high place and worship you. And it's almost like I can, if, if we can get to the point where we are mad, but we can say like Job, though you slay me, I'm going to follow you. I don't understand it, but uh, where do I have to go? But to you, yeah. John six, where do I have to go? But to you, you alone have those words of eternal life. But there's power and hope there. Yeah. And uh, Thanks, man, Christian. we 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 had ten pulled out. We only got through four or five of them. But we uh, would love to hear your question. Please, if you're listening and you have any question, uh, let us know. Send a voice memo to Levi at FreshLife.Church, and we will uh, try and get it on for our May first. Uh, what episode would that be? The first of May will be. You never know with a calendar. May 6th. Oh, we can't see it. Seiso de Mayo. <laughs> Seis, seis de Mayo. Seis de Mayo. I think it should be Seiso de Mayo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please send us a question. And uh, we, before we close, we do have a couple jingles. These are people who didn't ask questions, but just gave us jingles. <laughs> so uh, we're going to end with Take these two. Here's, here's number one. Hey, 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 it's the Lust Goes. Hey, 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 it's the Lust Goes. Hey! <laughs> Very good. Wonderful. We don't know who Dang, that is, but it's thank so you. So life giving. I'm gonna make that my ringtone <laughs> when you call me. When I call you? Yeah, just for you. No, what, what rings on my phone when you call me? Um, my girl. Brown eyed girl. Oh. Oh, is it? Is it my girl? Yeah. Gosh. It goes yeah. firm, firm, firm. That's right. Firm, firm, That's right. Firm. My girl. You never call me, so I never know. <laughs> <laughs> you text me. How about that? All right, here we go. Here's here's number two. For something hotter than Tabasco, a fun family fiasco. Hey, it's the Luscos. Hey, hey, it's the Luscos. Levi, Jenny, and Lennox, too. Hold tight for a second, we got the whole crew. Daisy, Olivia, Linya, and Clover. You'll want to hit repeat as soon as this is over. Hey, it's the Luscos. <laughs> That's my little jingle for your podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to mix it as you see fit. The lyrics are all yours. Uh, thank you guys for all that you do. God bless. That's the greatest thing That's amazing. I've ever heard ever. That was fantastic. <laughs> 
Okay, nothing could bring me greater joy than hearing that, that he rhymed Tabasco with fiasco. (laughs) Oh, man. I wish Tabasco was here to hear it. Well, play it for him. Oh, my gosh. Man. Well, we'll be back. That was really great. We'll be back next week. I hope you guys have a delightful Easter and uh, this and and spring break. Wherever your spring break plans take you, be safe. Have fun. Love you all. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening. And be sure to swing by levilusco.com to see what's going on in our world and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. In the meantime, we would love to connect with you on social media. Jenny and Levi Lusco, out.